Ladies, gentlemen, all those outside and in between, welcome to another episode of Rin Fair, a podcast dedicated to psychoanalyzing and critiquing media. I am your host, Connor Rinfro, one half of From the Margins. Listen until the end for more ways to hear me and support the project. Deconstruction is all about breaking down a text to find contradictions. Instead of injecting meaning into a text, deconstructionists try to show how unstable the meaning is. Structuralists believed that language is stable and has a meaning we all agree on. I say tree, you think of a tree. I say the store is open, you know I'm not talking about elevator doors. The structuralists also believed that the author is in control, and that literature is inherently consistent. Or at least it should be. Traditional analysis is taking a piece of literature apart to look at each part and then putting it back together. Deconstruction is taking it apart and leaving it that way. For example, I might have dabbled in a little deconstruction in my race theory episode. I looked at all the evidence of the Nagitsune actually being the baggage from racist oppression. The justified anger and rage manifested as a monster, and it continued to terrorize the Californian town long after the internment camps were closed. On its face, it could be a valid analogy. But the heroes defeat the monster by turning it into a wolf, which was classified as Western, and trapping it in a box of Nimiton wood, which is Celtic. To carry the analogy to that point would be to suggest that racial baggage can be overcome by assimilating to Western tradition and suppressing the other in a box of Westernism. Jeff Davis most likely didn't mean that interpretation, but that's the beauty of deconstruction. We tear the text apart and find all the contradictions. Roland Barthes coined the phrase death of the author as the ethos for postmodernist literary theory, which includes deconstruction. It's been interpreted a lot of ways since people got access to the internet, but what it means is that we as critics are allowed to interpret a text any way we want. Whatever the author intended doesn't matter. So I'm allowed to say that Kanema is toxic masculinity and that all alphas are mommies. The last part of deconstruction that we'll cover is binary opposition. This actually comes from Saussure and the structuralists. It's the pattern of thought that divides our concepts into dual opposites, up and down, on and off, male and female, west and east, man and beast. Jacques Derrida came in later to suggest that one concept is always privileged over the other. Post-structural deconstruction seeks to dismantle the binaries to remove privilege. There is no male or female. Sex occurs on a bimodal spectrum and gender is a social construct. There is no West and East, as far as unified civilizations are concerned. Man is but one other type of beast. For season 5, we had a few prominent binaries. Control over uncontrol. Awake over asleep. Present over not present. Friend over foe. And magic over science. That last one is interesting because I would argue that in the real world, science is privileged over magic. However, Teen Wolf casts the doctors as villains, their experiments as nefarious, and their attempts to harness the supernatural as evil. Usually, science means order, there are rules, and magic is a system that defies such logic. It breaks the rules. But here, we have an established order of magical rules that dictate our heroes' lives, and science has disrupted that order. So cool. For this episode, I'll be giving my plot summary, picking out oppositions, some dichotomies, and trying to deconstruct them to make an even more jumbled mess of a season that is already a jumbled mess. We begin with Parrish experiencing a vision which prompts him to search for Lydia. Last half, Lydia was left at the trunk of the Nimiton after Theo used her to get to the pile of dead chimeras. Parrish finds her there in a catatonic state. 
We already know that Parrish's visions are what connects him to his hellhound powers. Centering Lydia in all of these visions shows the thread of death that connects the two, but it's also super weird because she is a literal high school girl. And now, she's catatonic for the second time in the series, the first being when Peter bit her and more or less activated her latent banshee powers. Lydia and Parrish both are plot relevant because of their supernatural powers, but they have to be hindered constantly to allow the others to struggle so the story has tension. Lydia's mom signs papers to transfer Lydia to Eichenhaus. The Martin family might as well be the proprietors of Eichen with all the business they bring, first with Lorraine and now Lydia. On the surface, it's a mental institution, and a very abusive one. Read Foucault for a full picture of how mental institutions are actually centers of controlling and policing deviant people under the guise of maintaining normalcy. In secret, Eichen is also a holding cell for supernatural creatures, this parallel is bald-faced. The institution is sequestering away deviancy to uphold normalcy. The binary opposition here is normal over deviant. Teen Wolf establishes a protagonist cast of deviants to explore the marginalization. Davis himself said that he wants the supernatural to be read as allegory for racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. Flash forward to Lydia experiencing a vision of Theo's sister without her heart. Now Lydia knows that the Dread Doctors transplanted the heart to Theo to make him the first Chimera. Lydia also has a dream of Meredith, who promises to teach her how to control her Banshee powers. Meredith is the other Banshee, and she was actually the benefactor of the Deadpool in Season 4. I don't even know if Meredith is still alive, but I'm guessing, just like with Parrish, Banshees can communicate with each other through the realm of the unconscious. Sleep is a kind of death, I suppose. I said awake over asleep was a binary. The communication that occurs in the sleeping space is confusing, desperate, and meant to bring one back to a waking state. Let's really quickly review Theo's new Chimera pack. First we have Hayden, who is Liam's love interest. Then we have Corey, the kid who can turn invisible, and he's Mason's love interest. We have Tracy, the Canima girl, and we have Josh, the guy who can eat lightning. Hayden and Liam get attacked by the mystery monster from the last half of the season. This is the Doctor's last chimera, their success. I don't remember if there was any awkwardness around the fact that like four dead kids suddenly re-enrolled back in the high school. There probably was, but it's a TV show. Now Liam and Hayden are at odds. They used to be in love, but now Liam sees Theo as the bad guy, and Hayden has no choice but to follow him because he saved her life. Scott and Styles reconcile, they're no longer having their fight. And together, they deduce that the monster is an ancient creature recreated by the Dread Doctors. So they need to reunite their pack. Chris Argent visits Gerard and heals him. Yeah, this gets rid of his black goop condition. <laughs> Great. Yeah, the old dude is back. Chris interrogates his father about the last chimera, and Gerard reveals that the creature is la bête du Javodin. The Beast of Javodan. So this latest adversary is directly linked to the Argent legacy. The name of the beast was planted all the way back in the first season, when Kate tried to secretly awaken Allison to the history of her family. The first Argent came to prominence by slaying La Bête du Javodin. I think one of the biggest tragedies of the show is how much care the writers put into establishing a series-long conflict between the Argents and the Hales, two great families who shaped Beacon Hills and serve as a microcosm for the historical conflict between hunters and hunted. But because Crystal Reed and Tyler Hecklin both left the show, we lost our most important Argent and our most important Hale. But at least we still have Daddy Chris Argent. <laughs> Allison's daddy. <laughs> And he is dealing with his own daddy and sister issues, while also trying to help Scott battle the consequences of his family's history. Wow, we are really missing Allison now, when we could have someone in Scott's actual peer group grappling with these kinds of quandaries. 
Theo reveals that the doctors are trying to help the beast remember its past self. Knowing itself allows it to unleash its full power. Does this mean the doctors implanted the consciousness of the original beast in their latest chimera? And if so, did they implant this consciousness in all of their chimeras? Or is the beast itself its own unique consciousness, like the kitsune and the hellhound. But then, what good does it do for the beast to remember the last body it possessed? Scott and Stiles go in search of Kira. Kira and her mother went to New Mexico. They must have gotten confused between New York and New Mexico, I don't know. They get confronted by a trio of skinwalkers. Now, I tried to consult a lot of different sources when compiling research around skinwalkers because the Navajo tribes, whence the folklore originates, is very protective of these traditions. And after learning as much as I could about actual skinwalkers, I can see why they don't take kindly to non-Navajo people plucking parts of their tradition for entertainment. Skinwalkers are evil witches. They practice a black magic that is at odds with the healing practices of medicine magic. Witchcraft and magic in general are treated as normal traditions that one can learn. Magic as we understand it probably isn't even the best word. It's more like a science or an art. It's something that can be studied and applied. Witches to them aren't supernatural. They're just trained in an art. Skinwalkers have the ability to shapeshift at will and generally wear the pelts and bones of their chosen animal. I'm not surprised that they found their way into Teen Wolf, but their portrayal in the show has absolutely nothing to do with what I've read. So why even name them Skinwalkers? The Skinwalkers test Kira to see if she can learn control. If not, they will turn her into a skinwalker. From my research, I learned that becoming a skinwalker involves a rite of initiation in which you have to kill a close relative, usually a sibling. This is a practice witches take when they choose to become a skinwalker. Here, becoming a skinwalker is a punishment for not being able to control yourself. So the binary opposition is control over uncontrol. Kira needs to learn to control the kitsune inside her because it is a lethal force. Failing to control the fox means it takes over her body and kills people. If she can't learn control, then the skinwalkers are just going to turn her into one of them. But I'm not really clear what they're even supposed to be. Just a group of warrior women hanging out in the desert? The show probably elaborated more, but I'm not going to go back and watch all of it again. Kira's test is to fight an oni. Oni are like pawns that the kitsune can summon, so it makes sense that Kira would spar with one. But it's also tied to her race because of the whole kitsune thing. And now Kira is fighting against this race marker at the bidding of a different ethnic group. And the Navajo peoples are nowhere close to privileged in the real world and probably shouldn't be collected with an archetype of the West and Western civilization. But the text of Teen Wolf positions the skinwalkers as sages or wise warriors, and Kira is the struggling student. So this whole exchange just gets really muddy really quickly. Divorced of all that problematic baggage, it's actually a really interesting narrative beat for Kira's arc. Kira's inner fox takes control of her and destroys the oni, thereby failing the test. The skinwalkers attempt to force Kira to stay, but just in the nick of time, Scott and Stiles show up and rescue her. And when they get back to Beacon Hills, Liam and Mason tell Scott that Theo is trying to find a blind alpha. Obviously, that's Deucalion, the demon wolf. Scott and Liam discover the doctor's underground lair, and they run into Chris and Gerard <laughs> just hanging out, and they discover the painting that we saw at the end of last half. That mural of the beast and the hellhound fighting with all the dead bodies. Gerard and Chris decide they're going to help Parrish discover his true nature. They have this 
standing freezer that simulates the same trance work Deaton did with Isaac, Scott, Allison, and Styles in season three. You know, you get really cold and you're able to access your unconscious. I guess I was really onto something here with some creatures having unique conscious identities inside of their human hosts. Parrish needs to figure out what the hellhound inside of him wants. The beast needs to figure out who it used to be. Maybe Kira could do a turn in the freezer and just talk to her kitsune, figure out why it's acting up, and come to a compromise. Meanwhile, Malia and Brayden discover that the Desert Wolf is on her way to Beacon Hills. They track down the Desert Wolf with Theo's help. I don't know why they agreed to work with him. And they shouldn't have, because as soon as they find her, Theo hands Malia over in exchange for Belasco's claws. And now I'm also confused because... How did she get a hold of the Harpy Talons from the last half of the season? Was Deaton carrying them? Oh well. The Desert Wolf wants to kill Malia because when she gave birth, the newborn baby took some of her power with her. And she intends to reabsorb that power. What kind of weird mommy issues are these? Is this like an analogy for how women lose freedom when they become mothers? And the desert wolf is a bad mom because she would kill her own child to recapture that power? Well, their standoff gets interrupted when the beast appears and everybody runs away. Back in Eichen House, Lydia gains control of her powers and tries to escape but fails. The exact same sequence we saw at the beginning of season 5. So, you know, I guess we're all caught up now. Everything else will just take place in the present. And then off screen, Theo and his pack managed to actually catch Deucalion, and now he's blind again? <sighs> Theo wants Deucalion's help in stealing the beast's powers. Theo wants to use those harpy talons from Belasco to absorb the power of Le Bête du Javodin. Everyone is seeking power this season. Deucalion demands Scott's eyes in exchange for helping him. <laughs> Ooh, I guess the pack was wrong to offer him a redemption arc. Mm. So Scott finally gets the whole gang back together, and they make a plan to rescue Lydia from Eichenhaus. Deaton warns them that if Dr. Valak has drilled a hole into Lydia's skull, that's going to end up killing her. But with her death, she's going to do a supercharged death scream that's going to kill everyone around her. I guess that's just how banshees go out. <laughs> so it's a bit of a race against time. Scott, Styles, and Liam, for their half, they go inside of the Eichenhaus Institution, and Malia and Kira enter the electrical room to knock out the power. If you remember, Eichenhaus has a dual security system against the supernatural where there's mountain ash lining the walls, but there's also like the electromagnetic currents from their geographical location. But they're able to get Styles into the supernatural wing. He's able to reach Lydia, but he finds out that Valak has already performed the trepanation. Theo and his pack break into the asylum at the same time, and they have another plan to use Lydia to lure the hellhound to them. Theo wants to steal his powers too. But then the entire institution goes on lockdown and everybody is trapped inside. Well, Parrish easily overpowers the other chimeras, and he even badly burns Cory, the invisible guy. Theo manages to disable Parrish by just impaling him <laughs> and leaving him behind. And during the scuffle, Valak takes Lydia and escapes, while Styles and Theo are pursuing him. Kira's electricity begins to overload again, but Josh, the lightning eater, steps in to help by eating her lightning. And he does this on the condition that Malia will take Cory's pain so that his supernatural healing ability will kick in. Valak says he wanted to increase Lydia's banshee power so that she could tell him the identity of the beast. And if the trepanation didn't work, his next step was to put the Dread Doctor helmet on her. 
he has one of their helmets. I guess there used to be a fourth one that he managed to kill once. And they use the helmets to amplify their own abilities. And putting it on Lydia would connect her with her Banshee powers better. But before he can put it on her, she loses control. And she screams so hard that he dies. Meanwhile, Scott and Liam unimpale Parrish and help him turn back into the Hellhound form so that he can rescue Lydia. Parrish is able to burn through the mountain ash barrier, which means Scott and Liam can follow him into the supernatural wing. Lydia is about to unleash another overpowered scream, but Parrish shows up in time and he's able to smother it and saves everybody. And then outdoors, Mason and Hayden are able to restore power to Eichenhaus. And the security kicks back in and everybody's allowed to escape and just the whole adventure ends and it was fine. Scott and Styles take Lydia to Deaton and he's able to heal her. And we just forget this whole trepanation incident ever occurred. In the second half of the second half, so I guess in the final quarter of the fifth season... Parrish is fighting the beast at the school, but he loses, and they realize that the beast is getting smarter. Mason deduces that the doctors use high-frequency radio signals to trigger the beast's shifts. The doctors themselves travel on radio frequency already, so I guess they also can make whoever the beast is lying dormant inside transform through the same process. And they begin to get scared because there's this huge lacrosse game coming up that weekend, and there's going to be a lot of news coverage because it's being done for charity. And they think that that amount of broadcasting will cause the beast to show up. Chris, Gerard, and Lydia all work together to help Parrish access his hellhound side. Basically, he goes back into the freezer and Lydia uses her banshee powers to access that unconscious wavelength to talk to the hellhound. And the hellhound comes out and he tells her that he possessed Parrish when the actual human died while defusing a bomb in either Iraq or Afghanistan. Because I guess he's like an imperialist veteran or something. Back at the lacrosse game, Kira loses control and she injures several people on the field. That's never good. While they're playing, Mason and Corey are searching for the beast's human form. I don't remember how they test that. And then Malia's job is going to all of the news vans and disabling their broadcasting equipment so they can't report live from the game. But she gets interrupted because the Desert Wolf shows up and is like, Nah, we're gonna fight right now. And she's unable to take out one antenna or whatever. So that one news channel is able to broadcast and it causes the beast to show up and it goes on a rampage through the high school. Scott is able to corner it in the library, but he's forced to transform in front of a bunch of his classmates. So now the students know that their lacrosse captain is a werewolf. Uh oh. Styles, Liam, Malia, and Brayden all show up, and together they manage to drive the beast out of the school. Scott follows its scent to a car, and they find a pair of bloody sneakers. And it turns out, it's actually Mason's car. Mason is the beast's human form. And before they can do anything about it, Corey shows up out of nowhere and abducts Mason. So while all of that was going on... Chris and Gerard Argent were telling Lydia the story of Marie-Jean Vellet, the first werewolf hunter, and the woman who killed La Bête du Javodin. Marie-Jean was actually played by Crystal Reed because I guess they could bring her back to play Allison's ancestor in a single episode, but couldn't convince her to return to the show full-time. I mean, they've, like, brought several people back from the dead. It wouldn't be, like, out of the question. So Marie-Jean, with the help of this man named Henri Agent, hunts down and kills the beast after discovering that it's actually her brother, Sébastien. Marie-Jean later marries Henri and takes his surname, and they go on to become the Argent Hunters, or the Argents. Gerard suggests that Lydia might be able to kill the beast, but, you know, she's like, no, we should, like, go get Parrish's help just to make sure. Mason gets abducted again, this time by the Dread Doctors. 
Lydia and Sheriff Stilinski are able to persuade Parrish to stay in Beacon Hills and fight the beast he had been planning to leave. Deucalion advises Theo on what to do next. And so Theo kills Josh and absorbs his power. Of course Deucalion's advice is kill your bait. <laughs> like, are we surprised? But after absorbing Josh's power, Theo is able to wear that Dread Doctor helmet and he's able to see the beast's identity. But he doesn't see Mason. Scott, Liam, and Theo all team up and they find Mason in the Doctor's lair. But they get cornered by the Doctors and the Doctors, you know... They win quite handily, but then Mason turns into the Beast, and the Beast has no loyalty, and he just kills two of the Doctors. And then Parrish, Chris, and Gerard show up, and they join the fight. I don't know if they win or they get into some kind of stalemate, but the Beast reverts back to its human form. But instead of Mason, it turns into Sebastian. <gasps> Meanwhile, Kira goes back to the desert to ask the skinwalkers to help them fight Labet, the beast. And then Malia and Brayden have their final stand against the desert wolf in Scott's house. I don't know why they're doing it in Scott's house. I guess, like, the production realized, oh, we have limited sets and this is just the best one we have for the showdown. So they had a mountain ash barrier, but the desert wolf gets past it. But when she's inside, Brayden recreates it, and the Desert Wolf and Malia are both trapped inside of Scott's house. And then they fight, and at the end, Malia uses Belasco's talons to take away what's left of the Desert Wolf's power for herself. What a reversal! The child actually takes power from the parent. It's an interesting reversal of the Oedipus complex in which the son kills the father. Here, the daughter is killing the mother. Okay, okay. Sebastian researches for the surgeon's cane sword, which Gerard reveals was once the spear that Marie-Jean used to kill the first beast. Oh, right. So the doctors all had like different names. One was the surgeon, one was the pathologist, and I think another one was like the specialist. I don't know. So the one who was the surgeon was actually Marcel, Sebastian's old friend from the Marie-Jean story. All right, well, I guess Theo wants more power, so he kills Tracy. Rest in peace, Tracy. This is your, like, fourth time dying on screen now. <laughs> Sebastian goes to the sheriff's station and causes some havoc. Deaton comes to the conclusion that Mason is actually still inside of that body, like they're sharing it and struggling for control. And Deaton says that Lydia is the answer to saving him. She needs to call Mason's name and remind him of who he is. And, you know, this makes me recall when Lydia had to save Jackson from the Canima by calling out his Christian name all the way back in season two. Now, at the time, they said it had to be her because she and Jackson had such a deep bond. But now it just sounds like that's something she can do as a banshee. So does that, like, take away the impact of her saving Jackson all those seasons ago? Well, Deucalion double-crosses Theo and reveals that he was working with Scott all along. <laughs> Great. What an awesome plot point that does nothing. I guess they just really wanted Gideon Emery back for this season. <laughs> ah. So everybody gets together to fight Sebastian, but they're going to lose. But it's okay because Kira shows up with Lydia and Lydia screams Mason's name and Mason gets separated from the beast. Kind of like when Styles was separated from the Nagitsune in season 3B. He was given a second corporeal form to exist in while the other body continued to host the Nagitsune. Whatever. Mason's consciousness is pulled out of the beast and he gets a brand new body to go with it. Well, Parrish pins the beast down and Scott impales it with the cane. And yay, we solved the conflict but then theo's like i'm gonna attack you now because i still wanted all the power and kira uses her katana to open up a portal to hell in the ground and theo's dead sister crawls out of it and she drags theo down into hell with her <laughs> so so they just yeah theo went to hell <laughs> 
And then Scott finally gives Hayden the bite and being magically transformed makes her more real than when she was synthetically created in a lab. Magic trumps science this time. Styles decides to become a cop. Cancelled. No, I think he had like an ongoing subplot about not knowing what to do after high school and this is where he landed. I mean, his dad was the sheriff and he's always been like the deductive reasoning, like detective part. And so he decides he's going to join the FBI and Teen Wolf isn't really critical of the US's police state, unfortunately. But on a brighter note, Scott decides to go to veterinary school. So that's sweet. Kira leaves with the skinwalkers to gain control over her fox spirit. And she's never seen again. <laughs> Pour one out for every girl who has ever been romantically interested in Scott. <sighs> And then the season closes out with the doctor's final test subject, a Nazi werewolf (gasps) escaping from their lab. But we'll unpack all of that next season. I don't really know what to do as a conclusion. I guess I did notice that the prominent theme that connected all the stories was power and control. control. As a true alpha, Scott kind of has a divine right to lead his pack, and a lot of conflict was born out of challenges to his authority. Theo tried to take his pack, Liam was tricked into betraying him, Scott's own morals threatened his relationship with Styles. Kira, Lydia, and Mason all struggled with bodily autonomy. The Kitsune inside Kira wanted to go on a rampage. Several players wanted to use Lydia's powers to further their own ends and she was rendered helpless quite a few times while they manipulated her experimented on her and at one point even drilled a hole in her head we're not touching that symbolism I guess Parrish was also zomnambulating quite a bit, like season 2 Lydia. And Mason had an old French dude possess him and turn into a giant monster. How many times am I going to allude to Jordan Peele's Get Out before this series ends? The Desert Wolf and Theo, two of our villains, both wanted to steal power. We already know from Deucalion's season that alphas can steal power from their betas by killing them. Theo wanted even more, using the heart Harpy talons to absorb power from Labette. Malia stole some of her mother's power just by being born, and the desert wolf wanted that back, but instead Malia uses the harpy talons to steal all of her mother's power and essentially becomes the new desert wolf. That would be a fun psychoanalysis critique. I guess we should dismantle at least one of the binary oppositions I posited. Control over uncontrolled has been a motif that the series always returns to. Werewolves especially struggle with controlling their inner beast. They need to anchor their humanity to a strong enough emotion so that they can always recall their real self. Scott's first anchor was Allison, but I think it had evolved to a love of his pack. Derek's anchor was always his anger, in contrast to Liam, whose anger actually triggers his shift. I think Liam says at one point that Scott is his anchor, <laughs> I cry. <laughs> and Malia's anchor was Styles before they broke up, which must have happened this season, but didn't come up in any of my plot summaries. Oops. Control is the privileged concept because it's tied to the privileged concept of human, which is an opposition to beast. Oh, so maybe the human over beast dichotomy would be a better opposition to deconstruct. All the shapeshifters are weak when their two halves don't work together. True power comes from synthesis. Shapeshifters, then, are neither human nor beast, but a true hybrid. There, that's the deconstruction. Uncontrol is unprivileged because that's the condition when our heroes are damaging their own interests. Scott risks killing his friends. Kira risks killing the chimeras. And Mason turns into the worst monster known to humankind. Werewolves who don't know control get hunted. Hunters like the Argents and the Calaveras exist to maintain order in the mortal realm, or at least they claim to. Instead, they 
they use their authority to oppress and marginalize supernatural creatures. They police them to maintain normalcy. Normal over deviant. You have to read Foucault. So on one hand, we understand the practical value of remaining in control of your inner beast, but perhaps elements of this dichotomy are false. Scott's fear of uncontrol is what made him try to suppress his wolf for so long, which just exacerbated the issue. Synthesizing the wolf into his self made the issue of uncontrol pretty much vanish, except in instances of brainwashing, like when tr like when Kate tried to turn him into a berserker. But then we have Kira, whose kitsune is a separate entity that wants to take control of her body. So that's an interesting triangle. We have Kira's ego, Kira's body, and the kitsune. Kira has to control the kitsune if she wants to retain control over her body. Her conflict is very different from Scott's. She doesn't struggle to control her own nature, but rather to subdue a foreign nature. Oh, not a great choice of words. When is Kira going to get her own show? Her whole universe is so at odds with everything else occurring in Teen Wolf. It's like a completely different framework. And I think the writers knew this as well. They had no idea what they were doing with her in season 5. And I don't have any behind-the-scenes knowledge on Arden Cho's departure from the series. So I can't say why it happened. Cho herself released a statement saying Kira's arc was completed and there was nothing left for her to do. Is that her excuse for leaving Teen Wolf? Because she didn't like what the writers were doing with their character? Or is that the excuse the writers gave her when they didn't renew her contract. Either way, it wasn't really surprising. She was brought on to replace Allison and be the central character in the Nagitsune story. Once the scope of the plot moved back to the west, there wasn't a lot to do with her. I don't even think she had an arc in season 4, and her arc in this season meant she wasn't on screen for most of it, despite being billed as a star and main character. So I guess, in conclusion, control over un control is a false dichotomy because viewing deviant urges as things that are meant to be suppressed and regulated is what causes them to become problems in the first place. The werewolves have to accept themselves to truly manage the shift, and Kira was actually battling a separate entity sharing real estate in her body. That's it. I'm done with season 5. My least favorite season and my least favorite critical lenses. I did this to myself. Two more episodes to go. Season 6 is also a two-parter. Can't wait to talk about Nazis and Cowboys. Thank you for listening to Renfair. I hope you'll join me next time. Renfair is available to listen wherever you find your podcasts. If you like this content and want to hear more, feel free to follow me on Spotify, Anchor.fm, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Free Public, Bullhorn, and several others. Renfair is also uploaded to the From the Margins YouTube channel that I share with my content partner, Violet Knight. You can join us there to hear us discuss current events and our own interests. If you feel so inclined, you can join the discussion by becoming a member of our Patreon to support the growing channel. From the Margins with Violet and Connor is also available to stream on the audio platforms I listed above. Please check us out there as well. Until next time.